A uh, very good morning to everybody. Uh, my name is Manny. Uh, a little bit introduction about me. I'm a field CSO at Sentinel One. Uh, before my role at Sentinel One, I was a security practitioner. I was looking at security operations and security programming for a manufacturing company. And as part of my role at Sentinel One, I do look at uh, competitive intelligence and thought leadership. And I specialize in cyber incident strategy as well as risk management. So going into the session, I know it's a 30 minute session. Uh, if you do have questions after the sessions, do feel free to drop by me. My booth is right there. And if you see me somewhere on the walk away, then also you can come by. So going by the threats that we have in cybersecurity, so not a day goes by without discussing about the threats that are happening. And most recently, it's the generative AI threats that people are discussing. So from that aspect, we are seeing a lot of business email compromise using AI. We also see AI propel malware. Uh, um, basically, adversaries are using AI to generate polymorphic malware. And we also see um, LLM poisoning, data poisoning, as well as data model thefts. So we have to work with the threats which keep on changing in this landscape. So we also have the blue, blue graph basically talks about the resourcing that we have from our cybersecurity teams. So we work in a, a rectangle, I would say, with limited resources, limited budget, and constraints that we have, uh, dealing with all kind of executive questioning, questioning on cybersecurity threats. Uh, is the voice audible? Yeah? No, it's not? It's not? OK. Um, the voice is not audible. This is my first time too. I like testing it. So, <laughs> you guys hear me? All right. Good? Okay. Good? Thumbs up? Thumbs down. How about now? Nope. Yeah. Okay. I hear some yeses and some noes. Uh, maybe you can come to the front row so that you can hear me like my own voice. Uh, I don't mind that. Uh, but yeah, let me continue. Um, yeah, I think I do see like some puzzle faces in the audience uh, having issues with the audio. So maybe Alex. All right. Um, maybe I'll talk louder. Yeah. You guys can hear me. Yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. So the blue graph is basically the resourcing that we see uh, from the cybersecurity teams. Okay. Um, the cybersecurity teams, um, and we work in limited budgets. So that's basically creating a threat efficiency gap. Uh, work within a particular environment, but we do not have the same resources or the same way that adversaries operate. So looking into the challenges that we hear from customers. So the session is broken down into two parts. The first part talks about the security operation challenges. The second part basically talks about automation and AI. How can they help cybersecurity teams to better defend their organizations? So first one, uh, because of COVID or because of any other reason that we are seeing in the current landscape, we're seeing a lot of uh, uh, companies moving into cloud rapid rate of cloud adoption and digitization that's happening. So this is re resulting in creating more avenues for attackers uh, so that attackers can uh, attack on your cloud, on your on-premise system. So looking at the complex infrastructure that the organization has. We also, has, um, we also have multi-vendor stacks, so I'm going to talk a bit more in the next slides. But we do see a lot of cybersecurity tools in the environment by any organization at any point of time. And the reason is, within the industry itself, creating point-in-time kind of solutions in addressing only one kind of siloed issue that the organization has. So complex multi-vendor stack, creating that particular complexity within the organization is also an issue that we're hearing from, challenge, uh, from organizations. And triage and investigation. So this is the crux of my session. I'll be talking about triage and investigation specifically, how uh, security teams should be enabled and how they are not to move forward with incident investigation and response. Cybersecurity skill shortage, I think this is one of the favorite topics that's been discussed in the industry. So there's a lot of discussion about how there is skill shortage and how organizations are not able to recruit talent from, uh, from whoever is like available in the pool. 
Uh, but I, I wanted to mention about OT skill shortage. I know everybody talks about IT skill shortage, but OT skill shortage is also an issue. If you look at critical infrastructure, there are a lot many issues faced by the critical infrastructure companies where they don't have the required talent to hire from. So that's one thing that I want to specifically talk about skill shortage. This is in turn creating a reactive environment for organization. So if you look back in the past, it was traditionally a castle and moat approach where you know your perimeter, where you know your environment, where you know your infrastructure. But we moved to a stage where we're using cloud, where all your assets might not be visible to you. So we have grown into a stage of anticipation. It's not the question of whether the cyber attack is going to happen or not. It's the question of when the cyber attack is going to happen. So what are the steps that you're taking to mitigate the risk brought in by this complex infrastructure, as well as the different issues that the customers are facing in organizations? So as I mentioned before in my earlier slide, it's about the complex vendor stack. So on an average, it's 25 to 49 tools used by an organization on any day by a SOC team, and almost from 10 plus vendors. And 57% of the people have told that they have issues with regards to the complex vendor stack they have in the organization. So the quest for optimized security operations, as I was coding from my earlier experience, I worked in security operations. My ideal way of looking security operations is to have a single pane of glass where I would have all the information from all my assets, which would help me in inv incident investigation. But the problem is we have a glass of pain. We do not have a single glass where we can look and get the information. It's more about trying to go between different consoles, gather the data so that it helps me in incident investigation. So till now, what we talked about is the challenges that we hear from our customers, right? So we need to look at what's happening on the adversary side as well. So this graph basically explains the average time to execute a ransomware attack. So that has been reduced to four days or 92 hours uh, in 2022. And let me, uh, so they want to test like, okay, so let's say a threat actor is in your environment. How much time does it take to encrypt the data within the environment? That's the question they wanted to answer. So one particular research study took up uh, four Windows machines. They loaded up Windows on them and then uh, they wanted to see like how much time it does it take 50 GB of data to get encrypted. So they, they tried, they got all the malware pieces from the latest ransomware families, whether it's Black Basta, it's Black Alpha, or Royal Ransomware, or uh, Ruik uh, Ransomware, Logbit Ransomware. And they wanted to test like, okay, let's see how much time does it take to encrypt the data once the threat actor is in the environment. Any guesses on uh, how much time it took? Any random guesses? Maybe I should not ask if you're putting the headphones on. So maybe I, I'll just give out the answer. So it's six minutes. So that, that questions a lot of cybersecurity practitioners, how is your defense in depth strategy in terms of handling such ransomware families, right? And even if you look at ENISA report, European cybersecurity report that released uh, like a couple of weeks back, uh, if you look at the major threats have been ransomware and malware. So Ransomware and malware are not going anywhere, even if AI comes into picture, it just reduces the time to launch an attack. So let's talk about some of the wishes that security teams have, right? So the first one is reducing mean time to detect. So as a security team, as a, secure, uh, as a SOC analyst, you would have challenge in understanding like how do I reduce the mean time? How do I recognize an alert going into an incident? What are the tools that are available to me? Are the processes supporting me? And are the people trained enough to recognize the cybersecurity threats in the organization? So that's, that was one of my goals when I was working at a manufacturing company. And reduce total uh, cost of ownership. So you do not want another tool. You do not want another set of data coming into your organization to understand where is the threat and how is the lateral movement being done. You want the tools to help you also reducing the total cost because that's another challenge cybersecurity practitioners are facing because there's always this question of like, I need budget, but you already are spending a lot of money, so you won't be able to get any more money from uh, whoever the reporting organization is. So reducing that. And then improving performance and scale, as you have seen in COVID, right? You want to scale up. You do not want security teams to rack their brains and say like, okay, how does this tool fit if I increase to 500 or 1,000 employees? 
and then improve the efficiency the tools should be beneficial to the security teams they should enable the security teams to measure and have metrics defined rather than forcing them to spend hours with a support group understanding how does this tool work what are the reports that are being generated how do i communicate this information to executives so till now what we have seen is sock analyst aspirations let's look at some of the challenges that we have with the SOC team itself. Even if you have brilliant people in your team for security operations, you would definitely have these issues. And this is a very common pro problem uh, that I've seen when I interacted with customers as well, having disparate silos. So ha your EDR data would be stored in your EDR database. Your SIEM data would be stored in your SIEM database. And you have your cloud where your data is stored elsewhere. So how do you collect all of this data, make correlation, and then help you with the incident investigation. So this is an issue that cybersecurity practitioners face on a daily basis. And this is a headache for a SOC manager for sure. Because when an incident happens, the immediate question is, where is the data? Where can I find it? So if the data is existing in disparate silos, this is not helping security teams in any ways. And there are some statistics that I wanted to show uh, with regards to the disparate silos that we have. And yes, data retention. That's a, this is an important piece for anybody who's dealing with uh, DFIR, uh, forensics and investigation, because I have been in a situation where I had to retrieve data, which uh, data related to an incident which happened like eight months back, but the team was holding only six months of data. So how did you look at everything that's holding your incident data? Did you have your records retention policies aligned with your tools? Uh, how are you going to talk with your legal teams, your HR teams who are involved in the incident process because everything, everywhere and anywhere in the court, it's all about the data, how you present. All right, going into the crux of the session, the incident response. So there are three particular phases that you deal with when regards to incident response. Pre-incident response, this is related to your processes, people being trained on, on your incident response, how you prepare, so do your uh, incident response plan include all the sites that you have in scope? How does that work with regards to communication with executives as well as the team members? And going into peri-incident phase, so this is where the whole aspect of like reducing your main time to detect and respond comes into picture. And Particularly, SEC uh, released cybersecurity rules in July 2023. So as part of that, if you're a publicly listed company, if you're on New York Stock Exchange, you have to report a cybersecurity incident if it's material. And you have to respond within four days of the incident being deemed as material. So regulations are coming into picture. There are more cybersecurity rules that, that will come into picture even for private companies going forward because the impact has been huge across certain organizations if you look at industries. So that's, that's the second part of it. And the third part is post-incidents. So what are you learning from your incidents? Do you have a mechanism to collect the data on the incidents that happened? And how are you training back your employees or the SOC team on it? And how is the information being communicated to the broad as well as the senior management about it? And do you have metrics defined because of this particular incident? There might be gaps within your incident response mechanisms where you need to identify them and improve them. And this is the main important one that I wanted to talk to you guys today about. So this is the attack flow of an investigation. So starting with collection of data, as I've mentioned earlier, you have your data spread out in different uh, data sources, starting with your cloud, EDR, SIEM. So how are you collecting the data for an incident investigation? That's the first step that happens in a workflow and an investigation process. And then triage process. So triage process starts with incident in indicators. Like there must be some indicators that give rise you or move you from an alert to an incident. So what are the indicators and how is the team collecting them? That's the most important piece of it. And how as a executive or a CISO of your organization, how are you enabling your teams to collect that? Because most of the times the question quickly comes when an incident happens is that, okay, can you give me this data? Can you give me more details about the incident? But the inherent challenges that SOC team face are totally different from what you see from outside. Prioritize. So as I said, not all alerts turn into incidents. So how are you prioritizing these incidents, right? So what is the informational impact? 
CI compromise, confidentiality, integrity, availability compromise. What is the recoverability of the incident? So can you recover from this incident or not? In, in how much time? That's the most key part of it. And the third question is functional impact. So because of this incident, is it only one function getting affected or is it all global locations so that you cannot work anymore? And scoping, the final scoping that you get in terms of like how many assets are affected, how, many, uh, um, how much of the business impact do you have, can you convert into a dollar value for the impact that has been noted, and doing a clear analysis, what is the root cause of this incident, where did it originate, right from uh, the, the, uh, the threat has been detected to the time where it has been uh, responded. So the last one is basically response. So, Every incident has a different mean time to detect and mean time to respond. Not all incidents are treated different, uh, same. The, they are different. And because of that, the way you respond to a DDoS attack is totally different from the way that you respond to a phishing attack. And particularly in the recent times, we have seen interconnected systems between different organizations. Your OT and IT environments are being connected. And suddenly, your OT also doesn't work. Uh, this was seen in uh, colonial pipeline attack as well. So this is where we want SOC teams as well as organizations to improve on, where automation can place, uh, play a key role, as well as artificial intelligence can play a key role. So automation can be uh, as simple as like, we don't want people to go through that ingestion pains of data. We want data analytics to come into picture. You collect the data, you analyze the data. That's what we want organizations to improve. And that's what we are moving across as well. Now, once you collect the data, you want to help, you want help with the triage and investigation, right? So let's say an incident happened, a threat has been detected, and it's spread across all your endpoints as well as cloud. So how is the information being correlated? Do you have a process in place or do you have like your SOC teams manually going through everything and then preparing a report? So that is the place where you have a storyboard AI where you can correlate all the information that is being collected across your data sources. Now the last piece is we should not miss the importance of human intellect, right? How much ever AI talk, you know, AI talk that has been happening right now because humans uh, contribute or create value by talking about the process that can be improved, where AI and automation can make more sense to them in their organization. In my experience, I have seen organizations have complex infrastructure. That's where we want people to contribute and improve their processes, because just deploying a tool will not give you the business outcome that you want to have. So at the uh, time and place for machines, so as I said, like, um, AI can go through petabytes of data, can go through like in, in, in the time provided, right? Not a human can go through petabytes of data. That's where we want AI to come into picture. And we want humans to improve the process and enable the teams to make use of the AI or the automation that you have in place. And hu benefits of human machine teaming. So without uh, repeating myself, I just wanted to help you go through like what are the areas where you can get help in terms of like the benefits of human and machine teaming. For example, signal to noise ratio. So we do have the issue of multi-vendor stack, but we want organization to go a stage where they have a tight end-to-end -to -end tool integration where the data is not being repeated by each tool. For example, if your EDR is connecting your EDR data, you don't want the same data to be repeated in your seam so that it's an overlap of data as well as wa waste of time for analysts to analyze. And the last one, yes, staff efficiencies. Um, we are seeing a lot of uh, improvement in terms of the time uh, used to incident investigation and response. Um, also addressing the skill shortage issue. So automating the processes and the places where they can benefit more. Detection categories. So this is a simple example of like how data transforms into wisdom. So let's say there is data in your organization. We want it to be related so it becomes information. That's how your data collection process goes. And then it turns into knowledge when you correlate all the data that you collect across your endpoints, your cloud, your identity. And then we turn it into wisdom because that's how you improve your processes in cybersecurity in terms of people, process, and technology. Now, I cannot go through this session without covering David Bianco's Pyramid of Pain. Uh, the reason is for being a SOC team member, I think after I won't be talking about um, 
they like domain names because they are easy and simple to recognize for any SOC analyst. But after that, that's where you create pain for an adversary, right? Because when we talk about um, network and host artifacts, it's basically registry keys that can be created by specific malware. And your team should be able to recognize that. That's how you build your defense measures. That's how you build your defense efforts against adversaries. And then going into tools. So these are the specific tools that adversary bring into your organization, not with the ones that you already have in the organization. What do I mean by that? So they would be using a specific software or a malware, so malware instead of any software installed in your organization. And then you move into TTPs, um, a te a tools, techniques, and procedures. This is where we want organizations to improve their cybersecurity posture into because that's how you can defend uh, as well as create the most pain for your cyber adversaries. And we want SOC teams to move from like basic or uh, understanding trivial kind of information uh, in terms of pyramid, as you can see. Uh, the reason why we are going through this is because the malware, uh, we are seeing a lot of trends in terms of adversaries using malware to create polymorphic malware as well as metamorphic malware. So what does that mean? Uh, it's not simple signature-based detection anymore. We are going into behavioral detection. Right now we are into behavioral detection. Then we are moving into AI-propelled defenses because you need to counter AI-propelled malware as well. Now, the key point, uh, how can AI help security operations. As I mentioned earlier, you have seen cases where in your attack flow investigation, right from data collection as well as triage and investigation to response, uh, the place where AI plays a major role and helps security teams is triage and investigation. So it might be three use cases that we're presenting in terms of how AI can help. The first one, let's say your organization has a backlog of threat detections and we want AI to come and automate and as well as provide meaningful insights to your security teams. The second case is you might not have the time and resources, uh, the budget to do threat detections on a large scale. That's where we want AI to come into picture. And the third case, which I was talking at the starting of the session, basically moving across the consoles for data collection, right? We don't want organizations to go through that. We want a unified console where the data is being collected, where meaningful insights are being driven from, and where SOC analysts can make this information and quickly respond to any th threats that are being detected in the environment. Now, this is a vis visual depiction of like how the telebratory is being collected and how the SOC teams can analyze that. As you can see on the right side, you have the different data sources where the data is being um, collected for incident investigation. And then making use of the millions of uh, all the alerts that you receive, can they really make sense into an incident or not? It could be as simple as like someone mistakenly like sending an email, which they should not. So understanding that particular aspect and then correlating the whole of the data, just imagine this one with the attack flow investigation where you collect the data, you make sense of the attack investigation, and then you respond to it. As I said, not alerts result in incidents. I think uh, that's a key point when I talk to SOC teams. Uh, most of them talk about how you measure metrics for SOC teams. They talk about how many alerts are being responded, but we should have a mental model shift into how the incidents are being closed instead of understanding how many alerts are being addressed by a SOC analyst. So this is, this is my last slide. Hope uh, I'm on time. Alex, I'm on time. OK, cool. This is my last slide, so maybe I can talk for another hour. I'm kidding. Uh, I think it's lunch after this. So you guys, <laughs> yeah, uh, quickly going through the last slide. So the key takeaways. So understanding attacker mindset. So we have, if you look in the past, if you look in the present, and if you look for the future, in the past, it was always the castle and mode approach. Now it's the anticipation. The attack is going to happen. How do I reduce the risk carried out by this particular incident? Now we are in, moving into future where it's AI propelled defenses against AI propelled uh, adversaries, right? So assuming that. And then maximizing efficiencies, um, creating uh, or enabling the SOC teams with regard process and tools so that they are able to respond to the incidents timely. So this could be as simple as not just SOC teams, having tabletop exercises for your executives because there is a gap there as well in terms of like how executives respond to a particular cybersecurity incident. So there is no enough training as to what to talk and what should not be revealed in terms of cybersecurity incident. There have been instances where more information was given to the adversary just because of revealing too much information about a particular incident. And uh, as I said, like in, uh, um, 
Yes, uh, data driven approach. So as I said, data um, data is been an issue in cybersecurity. And if you look at broadly, um, having that data, figuring out the data and realizing insights out of the data is a cybersecurity problem broadly for a defense team. And using the tech assessing uh, human approach as much as, as I said about AI in my earlier slides, using AI wherever possible, wherever required. And I wouldn't recommend if you're using legacy infrastructures to go for AI because that doesn't fi fit your business outcomes. So understanding that part, I think that's where the humans contribute a lot in terms of like designing the strategy, understanding where the tools make more sense than process improvements is where you get the maximum business value. Uh, I have seen situations where we expect a tool to give 100% security for organizations, which is not possible. It, it always has to be a people process technology approach. That's when you secure your organization and that's how you build your defense in depth strategy. So these are a couple of slides. Um, and yes, that's the end of my session. And I thank you everyone for taking time to attend my session today. I'm open for questions. If you do not feel like asking questions right now, you can come by me and ask me the questions.